Now we're talking about tonight, the third group and what's in your future. And I told you that I came here to share that it's the season now, it's the time for the Wigglesworth prophecy. And there's coming a last great move on the earth and it will be according to what Wigglesworth said from the uttermost part of the world there, it will sweep up from here around the world. Now I have heard many, many prophecies about that last great move. And I happen to have this one with me. So this one came through Brother Hagen. I worked through Brother Hagen. I, I worked with him and he was prophesying a lot about that last great move. So this is, uh, I'm going to just read some of this. Uh, you are on the verge of the greatest move and manifestation of the Spirit of God that this world has ever seen. That's what it'll be from here in Australia. If you'll give the more earnest heed unto the things which you've heard, not only those things that you've heard about faith and about healing, but those, and those things, but also those things which you've heard about the Holy Spirit and the things you've heard about angels and the things you've heard about divine visitation. For remember, it was prophesied of Joel of old, that in the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall see dream dreams, and upon my handmaidens will I pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy. Hallelujah. The anointing and the outflow of the Spirit of God shall be great and amazing in those days. For there shall be visitations of angels. Be not afraid, but take heed, even in those areas, for Satan himself has at times come as an angel of light. But examine things in the light of the scriptures and walk in the light of the word of God. And sometimes the angel will give you direction, even in your finances. And the direction that would save your life, as in the case of the shipwreck of Paul. And direction concerning ministry as the salvation of Cornelius and his household. And Philip, as the angel spoke to him to go down to Gaza. And the Ethiopian was converted. And so in these days there shall come a mighty manifestation of the Spirit. And the work that God intended should be done in these last days shall be accomplished. For the time is short and things must be speeded up. And you'll learn much faster spiritual things than those of yesteryear. And you'll develop much faster. And it'll be said of some, they just virtually matured overnight. And they shall go forth to speak in the name of the Lord because they understand the principles of faith. They understand the principles of the kingdoms. And they'll understand the laws of God. And they'll operate and minister in that area. And nothing will be hidden from them. There have been some who have operated in those areas in times past, but they've let those things slip. They themselves in ministry and in life have slipped, but they shall be restored. Hallelujah. Um, the Lord shall be in manifestation in those days in all ways that he ever manifested himself, both in the old covenant and in the new covenant plus the multiplying of the Spirit in the power of God of those days. For as men grow more wicked and more wicked, and as Satan, because he knows his time is short, and all of his cohorts and evil spirits go about as never before to devour, so the power of God, the glory of God shall be increased and shall be multiplied. Applied. And it will flow like a mighty river, flow like a mighty river. Yea, the Spirit of God will flow like a mighty river. And many, not only hundreds, not only thousands, but millions will be swept into the flow of that river. And they shall show forth in praise and glory, for the glory of the Lord is in manifestation. The glory of the Lord will be seen on the faces of the saints. 
The glory of the Lord shall shine until men and women walk into a place of business and people will fall on their knees and cry out to God, though the person said nothing. The glory of God will shine through. The glory of God will shine through. For the manifestation of his power, the manifestation of his glory is reserved until this hour. If it could be told you what you shall see, even with the eyes of your spirit, if it could be displayed at this moment before you in a tangible form that you could see with your physical eye, it would be very difficult for you to believe that which shall come to pass. It shall be very difficult for you to, it would be very difficult for you to accept it. But as you walk with the Lord, as you prepare your heart, as you feed upon his word, as you listen to what the Spirit of God says, your heart shall be prepared and your mind will be changed until you flow in the supernatural as naturally as a bird flies through the air. And you'll flow in the supernatural as naturally as a fish swims in the water. And you'll flow in the supernatural naturally as you breathe the very air. You'll not be conscious of your faith. You'll not be conscious of what's going on around you, but rather you'll be conscious of the flow of the Spirit of God. And He will manifest Himself and He will accomplish what He desires. For you see, these are the last days and this is the end time. And that that is to be done shall be done. And the hearts of many will be caused to rejoice. So rejoice, rejoice, be glad and praise the Lord and prepare your hearts and let him prepare you for that which he has prepared for you. Walk in it. You will walk in it. You shall run. You shall fly. Literally, spiritually speaking. And you shall enjoy the fullness of that which is provided for you. And that's what you're contending for. And that's what you're praying for. And you're going to have it. Absolutely surely. Now what's going on with the body of Christ right now? Uh, what will we see happen in our future? Ephesians 2.20 The Holy Ghost is building something. The Holy Spirit. Ephesians 2.20. Remember we said all the Bible's for the church, but the part of the Bible that's about the church is the New Testament letters. Especially Ephesians is what's going on now. We are being built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. The body of Christ is being built a temple for the habitation of God. Victory Life Church is for the habitation of God. In some of the prophecies, Brother Hagin prophesied about that last great move, and he had to prophesy it before he left because he was leaving. He said, there will be such a presence of God that men will come in the back door and the presence of God, the glory of God will be here. And if they, have, if they, if they lack an arm, it will grow on suddenly. If they lack a foot or a leg, it will grow on. And he said this, he prophesied this. If they have no hair on their head, it will grow on. <laughs> and he prophesied much about translation. That a person would be in a certain, in, uh, like, like the leader of a country would be in a certain city. Television cameras would be uh, focused on him. And then suddenly, like in New York, and then suddenly television cameras would pick him up in LA, Los Angeles, 
Or you might say Sydney, and then they would pick him up in Perth across the continent. And they would know God is going to manifest himself to the peoples of this world. Hallelujah. They are going to see. And he wants to manifest himself through the body of Christ. Now, the last verse says, In whom you're being builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Go right on to the next chapter. For this cause. This is a cause. Young people like a cause. Here it is. Go down to the 14th verse. Ephesians 3, 14. For this cause I bow my knees. I pray. We're supposed to pray about this cause. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in your inner man, in order that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, love is a big thing to do with this. If I had another day, I'd teach on walking in love. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. I had a Baptist preacher. He'd just been filled with the uh, Spirit. He called me and he said, aren't these people born again? Why is Paul praying that Christ may dwell in their heart? By faith. So, for years I really didn't know. And then I saw it. When Brother Copeland was told by God that when you see Christ translate and meditate the anointed one and his anointing. That's what Christ means, the anointed one. So, they're praying that God would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in your inner man, your spirit, in order that the anointed one and his anointing may dwell in your heart by faith. The anointed one and his anointing in your spirit is powerful. And he's praying that you'd be strengthened in that spirit so that the anointed one and his anointing could, could be in you and without blowing you to pieces, without blowing you to smithereens. We're talking about power. And to know that power and to operate in that power, you have to know and operate in love. You are not going to do it without it. Love is the insulation for the power. And he said, I'm praying that you be strengthened in your spirit so that you can have that power in you. Bless the Lord. In order that, verse 17, the anointed one and his anointing may dwell in your heart, your spirit by faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height of love and to know the love of the anointed one which passes knowledge in order that boom, you might be filled with all the fullness of That's his will for you. To fill you with himself so that he can manifest to those principalities and powers. He can manifest to the peoples of the world himself. And you're going to have to be strengthened to have that kind of a degree of God in you. And you're going to have to walk in love. Bless the Lord. I used to work in the world. Oh, Shelly, I wish we had that little video you've got. But anyway, uh, we can't show it. We, we didn't arrange to do it. But um, I worked for an Anaconda Wire and Cable Company in a district sales office. And we sold power cable uh, from the size that wires your house to big, huge projects that went all across the country. And you build it up from the inside, you know, this goes and then that core and then this and then that and that. And then around it all is insulation. And um, 
So I was driving home from work one time. This is before I fully learned how to walk in love. And uh, the Lord said to me on my drive home, he said, Billy, there's not an angel that follows you around. And when you're real nice and you're at church and you and says, power up. And then when, then when you go home and you blast off at Kent, power down, you know, lest you kill him. I'm telling you, this is power. But he said to me, love is the installation of the power. So to have the power, to operate in the big power, you're going to have to be strengthened with might by your spirit in the inner man, and you're going to have to know and walk in divine love. Amen. Hallelujah. And I... I did teach on it one place where you might could get that. Where did I teach that? I don't remember. Praise the Lord. So we pray to know the love of Christ, verse 19, which passes knowledge in order that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. The future, your future of the church, your future, our future is to be filled with God. And the church of the living God, we're going to exist as an entity throughout all ages. Throughout all ages, there will be this identifiable body of Christ. All coming ages. And that identifiable body of Christ, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end, amen. The Lord gave me, and I'm not going to go into all of it, but he showed me many years ago because I heard Brother Hagin prophesy. I heard Sister Wilkerson. I heard prophets that were proven. He's not coming after a weakling church. He's not coming down after, he's not coming for a church hiding in rabbit holes, dependent upon survival food. There used to be a thing in America that you, that was going to be the way you had to have a kerosene stove. You had to have a supply of survival food. He's coming for a church that's filled with God. Amen. He's the most glorious bridegroom ever there was. And he's coming for us and we will be a glorious church. It is written. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for, it should say her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. We are going to be presented to our bridegroom glorious. Filled with the glory. Now, this glorious church, when you're born again, he comes in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then Corinthians says, we are changed from one degree of glory to the other. And what's going to happen is the church will be changed from glory to glory to glory to glory until there's only one more cap sheath of glory and we're out of here. Now here, uh, we're going to turn to the rapture when we leave. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Hallelujah. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And uh, you know, I told you that um, the letters are the New Testament. We're there in the letters. Thessalonians was the first letter written to the church. And it was written uh, because, you know, Jesus had appeared. He walked with them 40 days. 
And then they looked up when he went up to heaven. They said, this same Jesus shall come back. Well, they were looking for him back at any time. And uh, he, he didn't come. And some people started dying. And that, they really, it really upset them. He's not come. So God gave the word. He gave the doctrine uh, about that. So here we find it in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4 and verse 13. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and that word is a shout of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump, it'll be a shofar of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Hallelujah. Uh, Isaac, come on back up here. Take your glasses off. Bless the Lord. How many of you can see Isaac? Oh, praise the Lord. Good answer. You can't see Isaac. Because the Bible tells us that we are spirit, soul, and body. The real you is a spirit made in the image of God. Inside you is your inner man, your spirit man. You have a soul. You live in a body. So Isaac when he was born again, let's pretend because he, he kind of just came into it, you know, as a young kid in a home that had Bible study. And so, but let's pretend he was an old drunk, about 59 <laughs> years old. And uh, someone came along, told him about Jesus. And so he believed God raised Jesus from the dead. And then, I love this part, <laughs> the Holy Ghost killed him. He killed the inner man and, they, and he became a brand new man. You're not wrestling around with any old man. You might wrestle with your flesh, but the old man's gone. You're a bad, brand new creature. All things became new. Hallelujah. Now you didn't get, if you had brown eyes, you didn't suddenly get green eyes. No, everything in that spirit man became new. Now, when you fall asleep, and one of my friends uh, who went to heaven recently said that he was told there that um, it's not that the body dies and the spirit leaves. It's the spirit leaves and then the body dies. He said he was told even in the case of accidents, God knows that accident's going to happen and the spirit leaves and then the body can die. Well, my young husband uh, passed away, 49 years old. And uh, we were with him, with his body, at the funeral parlor, you know. And he was there. And Terry, Isaac's dad, said, Boy, Mom, you could really preach spirit, soul, and body here. Because anybody that knows Dad knows he's not home. He's not in that body. He's gone on. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. But this says here in verse uh, 15, we which are alive and remain, thank you, son. We which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. So for the Lord himself, uh, hallelujah, bless the Lord. Uh, we better start with verse 14. For if we believe Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. When Jesus comes, those who have gone on with their spirits, they're going to come with Jesus. And then we're not going to be glorified before them. 
For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. We had to put my husband's body in the grave. His spirit went on to be with the Lord. But if the body sticketh, you know, that's what was, was said. After a while, you got to put it to the grave. It's not redeemed yet. We're waiting for the redemption of the body. So here comes Jesus. We hear the voice. First, Jesus. It's a voice of command. I believe it says, come up hither. I believe that's what he'll say. Then we'll hear the voice of an archangel, and then we'll hear a trumpet sound, the last great trumpet. It's talked about in the Old Testament. And they will come, and their bodies will rise up and meet their spirits and be glorified. And we with them. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. That's wonderful. Those are wonderful, comforting words. If I had a, a, a if, I, if I knew, if the Lord told me when he's coming, I would go to the Prior Creek, Oklahoma Cemetery. And in that cemetery is buried my husband's body. And two or three graves over is my sister. My only sibling went to be with the Lord at 42 years of age. And just a grave or two over is mom and dad. And if I, had a, if I had prior notice, I'd go to the prior cemetery. And there I would stand. <laughs> and I would see them coming. And they would meet their bodies and be glorified. We'd receive a body, a glorified body like unto his glorified body. And we would ever be with the Lord. The second coming of the Lord is in two parts. It covers a seven years period. Uh, years are divided into um, seven years, a week of years, Leviticus 25. It's called a Shemitah period. So there's a Shemitah period coming at the beginning of which the Lord Jesus will come and they should call cemeteries, resurrection sites. <laughs> and that's when we comes, we meet them in the air, and then we go up to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Bless the Lord. Now, some people are a little, they, they don't, uh, they say, well, you can't find that word rapture in the Bible. Well, we don't need it. There's another word, and the other word is harpazo. It's a Greek word, harpazo. So I... And by the way, he sent me another message, Rick Renner, from Moscow today to tell you again that he loves you, uh, Pastor Margaret. And uh, he's a Greek expert. You need to be praying for him. He lives in Moscow. He lives right next to the Duma, the parliament. And um, he's a Greek expert. God sent him to Moscow. He lives there. He knows he's going to live there no matter what. And he's lived there for years. But if I need help with the Greek, I contact him. So I ask him about this word that is translated caught up. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That Greek word is harpazo. So here's what he, he sent me back. The phrase caught up together is the Greek word Harpazo meta, which is a form of harpazo. And it means to catch, seize, take away, to snatch suddenly. It carries the idea of snatching someone out of danger just in time. This tells us that the rapture of the church will occur in a dangerous moment. When things seem to look ominously perilous, Christ is going to come suddenly and snatch us out of danger just in the nick of time. The Bible says we will meet the Lord in the air. The word meet is apontesis in Greek, and it means to the meeting, to the reception, to the encounter. 
It is a technical word used for the reception of a newly arrived official or royalty. In other words, when we meet Jesus in the air, he is going to roll out the red carpet for us and he is going to give us a VIP reception and it's going to be grand. Hallelujah. They're getting ready there for that VIP reception. The word air is a Greek word that describes the lower regions of the heavens the lower atmosphere. So as Christ gives a shout and the archangel voices his arrival, the Lord will descend from heaven into the lower regions of the atmosphere. His shout will galvanize the angelic troops and resurrect the dead in Christ. And the Lord himself will seize, seize and snatch us away from imminent danger. It will be a VIP reception and from then on, we will ever be with the Lord. In Greek, the phrase ever be indicates at all times, all the time, always, continually, perpetually with the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, here are some places in the Bible that that word is used. 2 Corinthians 12, 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Most people know this is Paul. Whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows such an one caught up, harpazoed to the third heaven. Verse 4, 2 Corinthians 12, 4. He was caught up, harpazoed into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. And then concerning Philip, Acts 8, 39. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, harpazoed, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. And then it's speaking of Israel, Revelation 12, 5. And she brought forth a man-child, she is Israel, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up, Jesus was, into, unto God and to his throne. And so you see the meaning of harpazo is always that you're caught up to a higher place. Hallelujah. When after we're caught up, the first place you're going to go is the judgment seat of Christ. Now, if you make it that far, you're in. Bless the Lord. <laughs> but at that place, the judgment seat of Christ, um, there is the place where your works are going to follow you. You know, you're born again and your, 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 your spirit is born again. But after you're born again, you are rewarded for your works. So you do your works while you're in your body. And all of those works, you will be rewarded. So here is where the Bible tells us about it. Romans 14, 10. Why do you judge your brother? Why do you set yourself at naught? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10 We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he's done, good or bad. So you go to the judgment seat of Christ and that's where your works follow you. And some of them are... Uh, uh, they can be a different uh, building. You have built your life. Your works have been either uh, gold and silver and precious stones. That'll come on through. Anything that was wood, hay, or stubble, it'll be burned up and gone. And uh, so wood, hay, and stubble, I think it's the glory that will, that will, you'll walk up there and there'll be the glory. And so anything, wood, hay, and stubble won't follow you on into heaven. But God is such a rewarder. You will be rewarded for things you never thought. A cup of water you gave someone. A pat on the back. Everything. He never forgets anything. But you should know, uh, you should have, we're accountable. We're accountable. One day, I was sitting at my desk Brother Hagen had been in there talking to me, like he often did. 
He turned around, he had his hand on the knob, knob, and he said, I live every moment of my life conscious of that moment when I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for this ministry. Now, later on, I did some books for Lester Sumrall. And I would just go up and stay two or three weeks and do the book and work with Lester. And one day, he was there in my desk where I was working. He's about to leave. He had his hand on the doorknob. He turns around to me and he says, I live every moment of my life conscious of that moment when I will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give an account for every dime that came into this ministry. So we are accountable. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. We will, at the judgment seat of Christ, you will be given reward. And you will be, we could prove it from a revelation, uh, job assignments will be passed out. The Bible says that in uh, the chapter on the Hebrews 11, the faith chapter, that some refuse deliverance that they might have a better resurrection. So there will be better resurrections. But everybody will be happy. Everybody will be happy. But there is rank in resurrection. Bless the Lord. Now, after that, uh, remember he said that he wanted to, he would wash us with the water of the word that he might present us. So he's, we're going to go to the married supper of the lamb and we will have a presentation. Second Corinthians eleven two, Paul writes, I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste version to Christ. There will be a presentation of the body to the bride, to the groom. 2 Corinthians 4.14, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up also by Jesus and shall present us. Hallelujah. Colossians 1.21 and 22. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked words, you've now been reconciled in the body of his flesh through death in order to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Oh, there's quite a way they do this in Jewish weddings. The presentation of the bride. We will be holy, unblameable, unreprovable when we get to this part. Now unto him, Jude 24, now unto him that's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Presentation. Husbands, love your wives. This is Ephesians 5, 25. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and wash her with the washing of the water by the word. This is a picture of the Old Testament bride like Esther. I mean, for six months they washed her. They rubbed oil into her frankincense, whatever, another six months. When she went to that king, she was smooth. <laughs> and she was prepared. And this is what he's talking about here. We're being washed with the water of the word to be prepared for our bridegroom. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. He cleansed her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church. Not a church half in bed with the world. No, no. You won't recognize yourself when this thing is over. When the last little Gentile comes into the body of Christ, when the last, when you hear his voice, you won't recognize yourself, much less your mate. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. That he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, 
but she should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, even as the Lord the church. For, get this, we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Hallelujah. I'd like you to put back up that chart of days. And remember, we are looking at this chart of a six-day work week. 6,000 years ago was Adam. And at the end of the sixth day, actually, uh, when Daniel went before the Lord for his people, and he said, God, I'm praying, and, he, and the book of Daniel, I'll leave that chart up while I'm talking, it's not about the church. The book of Daniel is about Israel, God's people, his city. And the Lord said, 70 weeks have been determined for your people. That means God is dealing with Israel in 70 weeks of years. 70 Shemitah cycles. Seven year cycle is a Shemitah cycle. There's 70 of them that God's going to work. Well, you say, my goodness, it's been way more years than that. It's like a basketball game. Anybody in here know Josh Giddy? You know Josh Giddy? I love Josh Giddy. Josh Giddy is a basketball player. He's only 20 years old, but he's a rising star and he's from Australia. And he happens to be on the team that Shelly and I follow closely, the Oklahoma City Thunder. How do you know Josh Giddy? Come out here and tell me later, later on. Oh, what a fine young man he is, bless the Lord. But basketball, I really like it, you know. And a basketball game is uh, four quarters, 12-minute quarters. But no game is ever over in 48 minutes, never. It's like two hours. Because of what? Timeouts. Timeouts. Timeout for free throws. Timeouts for coaches. Timeout for commercials. So there's been timeouts with God's dealing with Israel. And so he said to Daniel, the Messiah will come, but after 69 weeks, he would be cut off. Well, that leaves one more week. One more week of years. One more seven-year cycle, Shemitah cycle, for God to deal with Israel and prepare them for their part. They're God's earthly people. We're God's heavenly people. One of my friends who recently went to heaven, Dean Braxton, look him up. He's on YouTube. Dean Braxton. He was told, tell them earth is not their home. Earth is not your home. Heavenly Jerusalem is your home. Now earth will be here and it will be populated and it will have Jerusalem as its capital and the ones who will rule from there are the Jews and then the sheep nations will be the other people on the earth with longevity restored. They'll be still having babies. I could teach you on the millennium and, and the how, you know how it says a lamb will lay down by the lion and a little child can play with. Chip used to wish he lived in that time. He could have a lion for a pet, you know, <laughs> lead it around. Bless the Lord. Wouldn't that be fun? But probably there are lions in heaven and you can play with them. Bless the Lord. Now, glory to God. So there is this period left. It is a week of years. Seven years. It's Daniel's 70th week. At the beginning of that week, Jesus will appear in the air. We will go up with him. He doesn't put his feet on the ground. At the end of that week, this is the second coming. He will come and put his feet down on Mount of Olives. We'll get to that in a minute. Bless the Lord. I love this. Don't you love to know your future? Bless the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 
turn to, where will we be? We will be presented to the bridegroom and we will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Turn to Revelation chapter 19. Woo! <laughs> Hallelujah. No, I got to prove something to you. Bless the Lord. I got to prove to you that you're not going to be down here going through this tribulation. This is the time called the great tribulation. Now, I have to prove it to you that you're not going to it through it. Um, Revelation 6.16 6, speaks of a time. We are already in heaven. And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? So now we're going to look at you. You are in the letters. Remember, that's your future. That's who you are. Romans 5, 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. The church is saved from it. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. You're delivered from it. And if that doesn't prove it, go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So the wrath to come is in that seven-year period. We're at the marriage supper of the Lamb, but down here on the earth is the great tribulation time. Now, Revelation 19. Oh, hallelujah, glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Verse 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude... And as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunder saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's our wedding music. God took Handel apart. You should read about it. Oh, quite a thing for three weeks. And he wrote the Messiah. Every word of it coming. The kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our God. When he came out of that room, tears were on his, his script, his musical score. I'm sure that we have wedding music. Our wedding, no wedding of the king or queen of England could compare to the pomp and circumstance of our wedding. My husband and I eloped. We did. Everybody didn't think we should marry so young, you know. We thought, oh, they're just saying that. They said, you have bills to pay and da 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 But, thank God, we eloped. But I'm going to have a wedding with all the trimmings. And I'm going to enjoy it to the hill. And I'm part of the glorious bride who has the most glorious bridegroom ever there was. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife hath made herself ready. And to her it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, uh, this is John the Beloved, and he has a guide who's showing him these things. And the guide says unto him, Write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. 
And I fell at his feet to worship him. He said, don't do that. I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. This is one of the saints who was his guide, who'd already gone to heaven. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven. Now the scene changes. And I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. When he comes for us in the rapture of the church, it's to make love. But at the end of the seven years, he's coming back to earth with fire in his eyes because he's coming to judge and make war. His eyes are as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Who is that? Us. We're the ones dressed in fine linen, white and clean. He's going back to earth because something's going on down on earth. The Antichrist has surrounded Jerusalem. The Antichrist thinks that he can wipe out the Jews. Sister Wilkerson said, there's coming a time when God the Father, God the Son, uh, the devil and the church are going to be in agreement. And that's when we go up in the rapture. Jesus is glad to have us come. We're so glad to go. And the devil is glad to get rid of us. <laughs> because we've been holding him back. According to Thessalonians, we hold him back. He'd like to come forth right now. He's already in the earth. I know he is. He'd like to come forth, but we hold him back. So we're at the marriage supper of the lamb and down there on earth, he thinks he can at last wipe off all the Jews. There's a war going on. We can read about it in uh, the 12th chapters and the 14th chapters of Zechariah. He has surrounded them. They think the, 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 the devil, Satan, the antichrist, the, the unholy Trinity, the false prophet, they think that they can wipe out the Jews and God's word won't come to pass and they can have the earth. But Jesus comes forth on his white horse with fire in his eyes and we're behind him on white horses. Sister Jeannie Wilkerson, great woman of prayer. She prophesied to Brother Hagin more than any other person. He could sniff her out. Sister Jean's here. She'd always sit in the back. And she'd come up and prophesy. Oh, marvelous things. Hmm. I was in Finland and going into Russia. And Brother Hagin was having a, a prayer seminar. And when I got out of Russia and back to Finland, my girls called me, Shelly and Brenda. They said, Mom, you need to get home. This prayer seminar has gone three weeks. And uh, they told me what Sister Wilkerson had seen. Well, I got back. It was still going on, the prayer seminar. And I went over to Sister Wilkerson's house to get her to tell me about what happened. And Sister Wilkerson said, well, I was there and we were worshiping God and I looked to the side of the room and in rode Jesus on a white horse through the wall. And he went up and down the aisles and I said, sir, what are you doing? And he said, I'm inspecting the troops. And then she said, Sister Hagen, Aretha, tapped me on the shoulder because I was caught up. I watched him. Oh, he went. And she said, he wants you to come up and tell what you're seeing. So she went up. Brother Hagen called her up. And she said, he was still there. Jesus on his white horse. And he rode up to Brother Hagen. He had a scroll all wrapped up. And he took that scroll and he tapped Brother Hagen on the chest. And it went into Brother Hagen. 
And he said, this, sir, these are your orders until. No man can stop you. No demon can stop you. Satan himself cannot stop you. And your own inadequacies will not stop you from fulfilling God's plan. So Jeannie Wilkerson knew about horses. She'd seen that. She loved to kneel when she prayed. Quite a woman of prayer. Oh, I could tell you story after story. How God would translate her into, as she prayed in her prayer group, he would translate them into Hanoi Hilton, that hotel. Um, actually, they called it the Hanoi Hilton. It was a prison, Vietnam War. And she'd be translated in there, minister to the prisoners. And they'd know she was there, and they talked about it when they got back. Colonel Robinson Reisner, my Jesus. Oh, folks, lift up your eyes. Look at heaven. Look where he sits at the right hand of the Father and put your mind there. Put your mind on these things. Peter talked about people being short-sighted. Don't be short-sighted. Some people say, well, we're not having children. I mean, the world's in a mess. You're not having babies for the world's mess. You're having an eternal person to be with God forever. And worship him and work. Hallelujah. Anyway, Sister Wilkerson broke her leg, fell and broke her leg. So she lived in Tulsa. She's a very wealthy woman. So they were taking her to the hospital. And they're driving down the road. And she looks out. And she sees a white horse running alongside the car. She says, what is this? And Jesus said, this is your horse. He said, you think things are personalized here on earth because you have monogram towels or monogrammed shirts. He said, that's nothing. He said, your place in the heavenlies is fit just for you, personalized just for you. And he said, everyone has a horse and it is personalized just for them. It's gated according to how close they followed the Lord on the earth. And so when you come back, and the armies which are on heaven, not armies down here on the earth struggling with the Antichrist. No, we're in heaven. Amen. The armies which are in heaven follow him on their own white horses. Yes. And their horses are gated according to, here's what Jesus told her, how closely they followed him on earth. If you followed him closely, your horse will be up to the front. If your wife had to drag you to church, You'll be in the back. <laughs> so I figure it like this. We've got a little short time here to get our ho horse gated. Quicker. Paced. Closer to Jesus. Remember, his wife prepares herself. We prepare ourselves for the judgment seat of Christ. For the things that are coming. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his vestment and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice, all the fowls of the earth that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourself unto the supper of the great God. There's going to be a slaughter of people on earth that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses. Verse 19, and I saw the beast 
The beast is the Antichrist and his system. And the kings of the earth and their armies gather together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, the Antichrist, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both, the Antichrist and the false prophet, uh, were cast into the lake of burning fire. I see it like this. They think they've got it. They think that at last they're going to wipe out all those Jews. And then God's word can't come to pass. But the false prophet says, AC, AC, stands for Antichrist. <laughs> There's a blip on the screen. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Is it Superman? No, it's him. And he's on the white horse. It wasn't an allegory. Some people teach in times that this is an allegory. No, it's real. It's a real white horse and a real king on him. And you're on your white horse behind him. And he comes down and he takes that antichrist and he takes that false prophet and he puts him to the lake of fire. With Satan, he does something different. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. First chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more. He's the one been deceiving the nations. That's why you have to use your authority and keep him off the heads of your government people. Till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that, he must be loosed a little season. Now there's going to be the thousand year reign. And the next part is about that thousand years on earth. In verse 7, the seventh day. And when the seventh day comes, the, the heavenly Jerusalem where you live will come down over earthly Jerusalem. There will even be interplanetary travel. He says who can come in and who can't go out during that time. Some can even come. Oh, it's glorious. It's marvelous. Your future is just as bright as God can make it. But down here on the earth, King David, Jesus is ruling, and the Jews. And at the end of a thousand years, bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Verse 7. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, and the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And then the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet were. And then in verse 11, I saw a great white throne. And here's the great white throne judgment. And then praise God, we find ourselves in the new Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Uh, chapter 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and first earth were passed away. I saw John, the holy city, new Jerusalem coming down out from heaven. Uh, as a bride prepared for her groom. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And there we are. Hallelujah. Praise God. Glory to God. That's your glorious future. And um, bless the Lord. He's coming. He said, I come quickly. I'm coming soon. Bless the Lord. Now, if you'll put that, if you'll put that uh, chart of days back up there, bless the Lord. Uh, before 
Adam's sin is eternity past. And after the seventh day, can you imagine that on this earth, all they've ever known is Jesus and goodness and they've had no temptation of the devil? But when the devil, devil comes, there's still been the flesh to deal with. And he's able to gather up an army that you can't even count and take some. How that happens, I do not know, but it happens. It's written. And they're going to go around Jerusalem. They're going to try to knock them out one more time, those Jews. And um, fire comes from heaven, and that's the end of it. And then the white throne judgment. But after this seventh day, is eternity future. And we really don't know too much about eternity future. But there's a glimpse of it that came to us in a prophecy that Brother Kenneth Copeland made. He didn't make it, he gave it in uh, 1984. Um, go to, uh, hallelujah, bless the Lord here. Go to uh, Ephesians 2 and verse 4. Hallelujah. I won't keep you all night. Just a little bit more. Now, here's a little glimpse into eternity future. Ephesians 2, 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, quickened us together with Christ, by grace you're saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus, in order that in the ages to come, there are ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us, through Christ Jesus. We live in the age of grace. The age of grace will be over when the last little goy, the last little Gentile comes in and the body of Christ will be complete. Now this body of Christ is going to show forth God's glory for all the future ages. And the Bible, and it says right here, he's going to show it forth. The Amplified does a verse seven like this. He did this that he might clearly demonstrate through the ages to come the immeasurable, limitless, surpassing riches of his free grace, his unmerited favor in his kindness and goodness toward us in Christ Jesus. There is a translation, and I've forgotten which one it is, that says he will show us off as trophies of his grace. Trophies of his grace. They'll look at us. The body of Christ will be an entity forever. Showing off the glory of God. Nobody can get into it after the door is closed. After it's shut. There's future ages to come, but they're going to be judged on works. Now, here is the prophecy that came through Brother Copeland. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My spirit, saith the Lord, I'm going from village to village, from city to city, from town to town. I'm going from shore to shore and from mountaintop to valley, seeking out and recruiting an army. I'm looking for those that will join me in forming the most powerful spiritual armada in the history of this planet. These are the days of my vengeance, saith God. These are the days of my vengeance to vindicate the blood. These are the days when I shall come down on darkness with all of the weight and power that light has to thrust. I'm ready to throw the body of Christ into vast battle array in the face of darkness and cripple the demons of darkness and cause them to crawl on their belly at the feet of the body of Christ. Once this occurs, the devil will never rise to his feet again until after the catching away of the church. I am and I will. I have said it and I will accomplish it, saith the Lord. I will have a glorious church and the gates and authority of hell will not prevail against it. Now, there's a lot that goes on. It's a long prophecy. I'm not going to read all of it, but here's the part that gives us a glimpse into eternity future. 
For these are the days of the greatest revelations of all. In the future, out in the distant ages, that you know nothing of, I'll give you a glimpse of what it shall be like. Never again, never in any age, never in the future again, will there be the likes of you. You will walk the streets of the cities of the planets and the stars. I built the universe for you, and you'll travel it with me. And all of those that shall be born in the future, and all the years to come down here on earth, as natural men and natural women, they'll say to one another, there comes one of the kings. There comes one of the special ones. There comes the image of the master. Oh, that we had lived in that age. They are so special. They get the best of everything. Their father keeps them in his bosom. Oh, we have it blessed and we have it good. But it's because of them. They walk in the glory realm. They walk in the light realm. We have joy. They have ecstasy. Hallelujah. Lots in the prophecy. It's a good one. I'll send it to you, Margaret. Bless the Lord. But here we are. And this is it. And it's up to you to prepare for these things and to put your mind on heavenly things and the unseen realm and let God change you. Now, I would like, if there are any pastors in here tonight, please raise your hand. If you are a pastor, or, and your wives, and, uh, or your husbands, your mate, I want to lay hands on you. Bless the Lord for this great move of God that's coming. Because hands have been laid on me, oh my goodness, who knew about this move, who prophesied about this move? Brother Hagen, Brother Duplessis, Brother Sumrall, Sister Wilkerson, other brothers you don't know, but oh my, what a power of God they had. Sister, uh, John G. Lake's daughter. My goodness. And uh, there's, a, there's impartation. It's one of the fundamental Doctrines of Christ, the laying on of hands. And the Bible says, the same spirit that was in Moses was in Joshua. For Moses had laid his hands on them. So if you are a pastor, of a, or if you are a youth pastor, bless the Lord. Or if you are a traveling minister, apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, teacher. Are there any here? Raise your hands. Mm -hmm. You come. Mm -hmm. And I want to lay hands on you. Bless the Lord. 